Hello and welcome to Maximum Fleetwood Mac, the first talking book about the band. It was written and researched by Ben Graham, music is by Amanda Thompson, and it is read by Nancy McLean. You can check out our full catalogue on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk. Nothing seems to uh, stop me by it. I like to emulate the other, the actual record of the style. I do like to go um, pretty much as near to it as I can get, you know. In the beginning, there was the blues. To any hip young musician, art student or cat about town in London in the mid-60s, the blues were what mattered. And throughout the 60s, the most respected and long-standing British blues bands were the Blues Breakers, led by the redoubtable John Mayle. Mayle had arrived in London from Manchester in 1963 and wasted no time in forming the Blues Breakers, whose lineup would soon stabilise as Bernie Watson on guitar, Peter Ward on drums and John McVie on bass. McVie, born on November 26, 1945, was the son of a sheet metal worker from Ealing, West London. He had previously played in a shadow style band and knew nothing about the blues, but following his successful audition, Mail quickly brought him up to speed. The older musician's advice to keep it simple would stand McVie in good stead throughout his career. Mail had been an avid blues collector since 1949 and so had access to obscure and much coveted recordings which the band could learn and perform. This earned them the respect of their peers, the critics and cognoscenti, and kept them in regular live work and recording sessions, often backing visiting American blues legends such as John Lee Hooker. But the blues breaker's sound changed dramatically when Eric Clapton joined in 1965. His guitar style was more aggressive, upfront and commercial than anything Mayle had experimented with previously. The blues breakers were suddenly a hot draw, with Clapton the star attraction. But the guitar hero quit only a few months after he joined, spending August to November 1965 busking around Greece. Clapton's replacement was a complete unknown, Peter Green. Born Peter Allen Greenbaum on the 29th of October 1946, the third son of second-generation Jewish immigrants, he was a sensitive child who took up the guitar in his early teens. The family shortened their name to Green when he was two, having had enough of the anti-Jewish taunts that were commonplace in their Bethnal Green neighbourhood. Peter played with several small-time bands before talking his way into the Blues Breakers. He had idolised Clapton, whose influence had caused him to switch from bass to lead guitar, but he was obviously a prodigious talent in his own right. Mayle recognised this and gave him both the much sought-after and unenviable task of filling Clapton's shoes. The job was only temporary, however, and by the beginning of 1966, with Clapton back in the lineup, Peter Green was making his recording debut with Peter Barden's Lunars, featuring drummer Mick Fleetwood. Mick was born in Cornwall on the 24th of June 1947, the son of RAF Wing Commander Michael Fleetwood, and went to a minor public school in Sherborne, where he discovered a talent for the drums. In 1963, at the age of 16, he arrived in London to seek his fortune as a musician. His break came when a neighbour, Peter Bardens, heard him drumming in his garage and asked him to form a band, The Chains, with Bardens on organ. They lasted until the spring of 1965, when Mick briefly joined the Bow Street Runners before rejoining Bardens in the Lunars in 1966. The Lunars evolved into Shotgun Express and struggled on until 1967, but by the summer of 1966, Peter Green had left the band and rejoined the Blues Breakers, following Eric Clapton's permanent departure to form the supergroup Cream. Clapton had his own large and loyal following in the Blues Breakers audience, who referred to him as God. But Peter Green had his own style, a haunting, emotive wail that eschewed Clapton's grandstanding for a soulful purity that came from the heart. Of all the British blues musicians, Peter was the most authentic, because he didn't try to ape the sound of his American counterparts. Instead, he drew on his Jewish roots and his own sadness and pain to create a unique, utterly recognisable sound that soon won over his critics. 
At this point, the Blues Breakers drummer was the brilliant Ainsley Dunbar. But Mayo was becoming increasingly annoyed at his overly flashy playing and his tendency to take long, showy solos. In April 1967, he was fired from the band and replaced, at Peter Green's suggestion, by Mick Fleetwood. Fleetwood's style was the polar opposite of Dunbar's, solid, simple and unprepossessing. He may not have been technically as good as his predecessor, but his trademark shuffle sound fitted in perfectly with Green's slow, keening guitar and McVie's unpretentious bass playing. Mail, however, wasn't particularly impressed, and Mick lasted only six weeks in the Blues Breakers. He additionally aggravated the teetotal Mail by going on drinking binges with the legendary boozer McVie, who had already been fired and reinstated from the band on several occasions for his alcoholic excesses. Despite this, Fleetwood, McVie and Green quickly recognised the chemistry between them. During the short time the trio were all part of the Blues Breakers, they recorded a driving instrumental track that Green named after the rhythm section, thinking the combination sounded like an old American freight train. Fleetwood Mac. Magical. It looks might look same, similar to others from a distance, but it was a bit old fashioned. One with a funny shaped neck, so it was kind of semi-circle shaped neck. The pickups were good, but uh, I, took, I took one of them off. I'm going to take my my bass pickup off altogether uh, for some reason. Uh, I put it back on, I put it back on the wrong way. So people say to me, "You're you've got that special sound which was out of phase." Peter Green quit the Blues Breakers in June 1967, feeling the band was straying too far from their blues roots. Initially, he planned to visit Chicago and record with black blues musicians there, but the race riots raging across America at the time dissuaded him. Instead, he resorted to Plan B, forming a new band with Fleetwood and McVie. Mick was immediately up for it, but convincing John to leave behind a steady wage with the Blues Breakers was less easy. In the meantime, producer Mike Vernon had recommended a young guitarist from Litchfield called Jeremy Spencer to the band. Green hadn't initially wanted a second guitarist, but when he heard the tape of Spencer's band that Vernon presented, he headed straight to the Midlands, where he forcefully recruited Spencer into Fleetwood Mac. Spencer, as tiny as Mick Fleetwood was tall, was born in Hartlepool on the 4th of July 1948. Although his first love was rock and roll, he quickly fell under the spell of blues legend Elmore James. Spencer had an incredible talent for mimicry, and was soon able to reproduce James's electrifying bottleneck guitar style and vocal wail with uncanny accuracy. He was always a somewhat schizophrenic character, a family man and committed Christian who took his Bible on tour, only to turn into a foul-mouthed rock and roll animal as soon as they hit the road. With McVie still unwilling to leave the Blues Breakers, the original lineup was completed by bassist Bob Brunning and Fleetwood Mac made their live debut at the prestigious Windsor Jazz and Blues Festival on Sunday, August the 13th, 1967. Peter had negotiated a record deal with Mike Vernon's Blue Horizon label and while the band got their chops together on the road, Vernon was sneaking them into the studios of Decca Records, where he was in-house producer, in the middle of the night to lay down tracks for their debut album. By December 1967, John McVie finally joined up and Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac was released in February 1968, reaching the top five in the album chart, despite a complete absence of hit singles. Both I Believe My Time Ain't Long and Black Magic Woman, later a huge hit for Santana, were flops, and a third single, Need Your Love So Bad, fared only slightly better. By this time, the band had released a second album, Mr. Wonderful, which came out in August of the same year, reaching number four. The group toured solidly, visiting Europe and America for the first time, and steadily built a loyal, grassroots following that paid little attention to the fickleness of the singles charts. These were older music fans, rather than teeny boppers, who preferred the depth and longevity of album releases. 
Fleetwood Mac were one of the first bands to accidentally tap into this audience, creating an albums and live orientated market that the likes of Led Zeppelin would later exploit with huge success. Both albums were a mixture of Peter Green originals and traditional blues songs, with Peter and Jeremy alternating lead vocals and Jeremy's Elmore James slide attack contrasting with Peter's more considered soulful playing. The second album added saxophones and was recorded in distorted mono through old Vox amplifiers, giving it a deliberately murky sound reminiscent of the chess blues recordings of the 1940s. In addition, the single Need Your Love So Bad featured one Christine Perfect, then in the band Chicken Shack, on organ. No one in Fleetwood Mac then realised what an important role she would play in the group's future. At this time, Fleetwood Mac were very much a lads band. Their live shows were raucous, ribald affairs, a reaction against the po-faced blues purism of the day. Stage props included Harold, the 16-inch dildo that would be brought on stage on a silver platter before being attached either to Mick Fleetwood's bass drum or to Jeremy Spencer's crotch as, dressed in a gold lame suit, he belted out a set within a set of 50s rock and roll parodies. Condoms full of milk and beer would be attached to the ends of guitars and swung over the heads of the audience. Green, however, was already growing frustrated with the dynamics of the band. Spencer was brilliant up to a point, but his limitations were becoming obvious and he refused to write new material or change his style. So Peter decided to add a third guitarist to Fleetwood Mac in the shape of 19-year-old Danny Kerwin. Kerwin was a precocious guitarist who inspired Peter Green to write some of the most personal and powerful songs of his career, tunes that were already moving away from the band's strict blues template. Green also threw Danny in a deep end as a songwriter, informing him that half of the next Fleetwood Mac LP would be his responsibility. But Kerwin rose to the challenge, and the result would be both Fleetwood Mac Mark I's crowning glory and their downfall. Inspired by the aircraft of John Mayer's Blues Breakers, they did a song called uh, The Last Meal, Jimmy Rogers' song. Jimmy Rogers uh, from Chicago, not the country western one, the blues one. I thought I would take it and sort of develop it. That's where I got Albatross from. And also Sleepwalk, I thought that was so unique. Albatross was released in November 1968, signalling the beginning of an amazing run of singles chart successes for the band and going straight to number one. A dreamy, Hawaiian-sounding instrumental, it was an instant classic, but its unique sound and sudden success prompted many of Fleetwood Mac's album-loving, blues purist fans to accuse them of selling out. The band were perplexed by such accusations. They were playing to the same number of people they always had, and they had always intended their music to progress. They had also always wanted to have hit singles, or so they thought. By the time Albatross topped the charts, Fleetwood Mac were in the middle of their second US tour. It was here that they tried LSD for the first time. They'd become good friends with the Grateful Dead, and through them, the infamous acid entrepreneur, Augustus Stanley Owsley III. He was known for manufacturing the purest LSD around, and the band were eventually persuaded to try it, blissfully unaware of its long-term consequences. They also found time to record with several of their blues heroes in Chicago, sessions that were eventually released as no less than two double albums a year or so later. In the meantime, 1969 saw the release of two cash-in compilations, English Rose and Pious Bird of Good Omen, before the third Fleetwood Mac album proper, then Play On, emerged in September 1969. On the singles front, Albatross was followed in March 1969 by another green composition, Man of the World. It was the blues in spirit, but played and sung from the perspective of a working-class English Jew turned touring rock star in the late 60s, rather than an Afro-American sharecropper from 50 years earlier. One of the strangest, most personal and harrowing songs ever to reach number two on the hit parade, Man of the World, 
was also Fleetwood Mac's sole release on Andrew Lug Oldham's immediate label. By the time of their next single, Oh Well, they were firmly ensconced on Warner Brothers. This was another unlikely number two hit, driven by an ungainly, punishing guitar riff, whilst the B-side, Oh Well Part Two, was nearly nine minutes of classically arranged acoustic guitar, cello and flute. Then, completing this astonishing run of bizarre hit singles, there was The Green Manalishi, number 10 in May 1970. Howling, proto-psychedelic chords, chanted vocals and eerie sound effects merged together beneath a nightmarish lyric, concerning the temptations of materialism and the flesh, symbolized by the demonic green manalishi with a two-pronged crown. Discerning listeners may have read something into Peter Green's increasingly fragile state of mind from these last three singles, and the sense of disillusionment, despair and spiritual questing was expanded on the And Then Play On album. Tracks like Closing My Eyes and Showbiz Blues were full of questioning self-pity, lightened only by the ode to therapeutic masturbation, Rattlesnake Shake. Confused by the band's sudden success, guilty at the fame and fortune he was accumulating, and touched by the tragedy he saw elsewhere in the world, Green found the rock star lifestyle empty and meaningless, and turned to religion and acid in equal measures for answers. He began appearing on stage in flowing white robes, his hair and beard worn long, claiming to be Jesus Christ. And most alarmingly for the rest of the band, he began insisting that they give all their money away. The final straw came when Green went to a party at a German commune with a group of rich hippie dropouts and would-be political radicals known as the Munich Jet Set. He disappeared for several days, during which time he dropped acid and recorded lengthy free-form jams with the commune crowd until the band's road manager was sent to bring him home. He insisted that he wanted to leave Fleetwood Mac and join the commune, and although he was persuaded to finish the tour, the Munich jet set continued to stalk him and influence his thinking. On the 25th of May 1970, Peter Green played his last official date with Fleetwood Mac at London's Lyceum alongside the Grateful Dead. By this time, Green was convinced that the music business was evil and that the money he'd made was unclean. Afterwards, he was seen backstage, crazed on acid, trying to burn the band's amplifiers. He would quit the group to become a grave digger, leading to over two decades' worth of mental health problems, alcoholism, menial work, and aborted comebacks. But for many, his decision was an honorable one, a clean break with the music industry at the height of his success. But, be that as it may, Fleetwood Mac were now without a leader. At that time, when the, say, Presley first started, or when the Beatles came out, the actual music establishment thought, well, this is it, you know, nothing else can happen. And it took a Presley or a Beatles to show them, well, there, there is something new. The early 70s were Fleetwood Mac's wilderness years, a period where they nevertheless managed to tour almost constantly and record a succession of respectable selling albums, despite never seeming to have the same lineup from one record to the next. Members continued to leave and be replaced at an astonishing rate and in increasingly fraught circumstances. It was only the determination of drummer Mick Fleetwood, now band leader by default, which kept the group just about together. The first to leave after Peter Green was Jeremy Spencer. The band had made a new album, Kiln House, and the material was split between Spencer's rock and roll parodies and Danny Kerwin's melodic, haunting compositions, including the excellent but commercially unsuccessful single Dragonfly. The band set out on another American tour to promote it and arrived in Los Angeles in the wake of a major earthquake. Spencer had been acting strangely already on the tour. He had begged with Mick not to make him go to LA, saying that he'd had premonitions and nightmares that something dreadful was going to happen. Eventually, he gave in and the band checked into a hotel. Jeremy said that he was going out to visit a local bookstore. They never saw him again. 
After several days, Fleetwood Mac's management tracked Jeremy down. He had joined the notorious evangelical Christian hippie cult, the Children of God, and was staying at their stockade on the outskirts of the city. The cult forbade Clifford Davis, Fleetwood Mac's manager, from seeing him, but he drove out there anyway, through the eerie earthquake-stricken landscape to the edge of the desert and fought his way in. Spencer had shaved his head and claimed that he was perfectly happy and had joined the cult of his own free will. This was what he was looking for. Brainwashed acid casualty or not, he would later bring over his wife and child and the whole family would remain with the group for the next two decades. This didn't help Fleetwood Mac, however, who had live commitments to honour. Somehow, Peter Green was convinced to temporarily rejoin the group for the remainder of the tour, which he did on condition that they didn't play any of the old songs, but just went out and jammed for an hour and a half, accompanied by his friend Nigel on congas. He also wanted to be known as Peter Blue. Reluctantly, the band agreed. By this time, Christine Perfect had married John McVie, taking on his surname, and after making some unaccredited contributions to Kiln House, had become a full-time member of the group. She would also write several strong songs for Fleetwood Mac's next album, Future Games, composed and recorded at Benefolds, a country estate the band had bought in Hampshire to live and work in communally. The album also saw the debut of Spencer's replacement, an American singer-guitarist and songwriter called Bob Welch, who contributed a country rock flavour to the band's still blues-based musical stew. This lineup would also record 1972's underrated Bear Trees album, a spare haunting record with a bleak wintry cover that, while reflecting the music within, did it few commercial favours. The band once more set out on tour, but this time it was Danny Kerwin who was coming apart at the seams. Since joining the band as a teenager, just as they hit the top of the singles charts with Albatross, he had struggled to come to terms with fame and success. LSD had hardly helped his fragile personality, and following the departure of Peter Green, his problems worsened, as he still felt he was in his mentor's shadow. He swung from extreme paranoia to arrogance, and developed a serious drink problem. Matters came to a head in 1972, when he threw a tantrum in the dressing room before a gig, smashing up his guitar and a mirror for no apparent reason. He refused to go on stage, and instead watched the band from the mixing desk criticising their performance afterwards. He was duly fired. Kerwin was replaced by guitarist Bob Weston and ex-Savoy Brown singer Dave Walker, although both lasted only a few months. Someone had prevailed upon the band that they needed a strutting, hard-rocking frontman who could put on a show and communicate with the audience, and Walker, with his snakeskin cowboy boots and Indian jewellery decorating his exposed chest, seemed just the ticket. However, his flashy style never really gelled with Fleetwood Mac, and he appeared on just one track on their next album, Penguin. The band were also jealous of the attention he was getting on the subsequent tour and fired him at its conclusion. Weston lasted for one more album, Mystery to Me, before being fired for having an affair with Mick's model wife, Jenny. Fleetwood Mac were now in complete disarray. The McVee's marriage was also on the rocks, as John's drinking drove Christine into the arms of the band's sound man, Martin Birch. Mick Fleetwood was on the verge of a breakdown from his own marital problems, and following Weston's sacking in October 73, the band split up midway through an American tour. The remaining dates were postponed as the various members flew off to separate corners of the earth, and at the time, no one knew if the band was finished for good. The result was the notorious fake Fleetwood Mac, hastily assembled from various session musicians by manager Clifford Davis, who completed the US dates. This lineup of the group contained no original members, in fact no one who'd been in the band at any stage before, although Davis claims that the project had Mick Fleetwood's blessing and that he had promised to join them at some stage in the tour. Mick has always denied this. In any case, Davis claimed that he owned the rights to the name Fleetwood Mac, rather than the two musicians whose surnames it obviously drew on. Neither, however, seemed to give a damn anymore, and it took Bob Welch, now back in the States, to rally John, Mick and Christine together to launch legal action against Davis, and to get the real Fleetwood Mac back on the road.
Lindsay, while he was in Fleetwood Mac, was obviously an integral part, an important part of, of Fleetwood Mac. And uh, he worked very hard and, and put a lot of energy into the band, as we all do. At the beginning of 1974, Bob Welch, Mick Fleetwood, John and Christine McVie left Benefolds and moved to L.A. The legal proceedings between the band and their former management had made it impossible for them to work in England and they had long been enjoying greater success in America than at home anyway. Here, they could re-establish themselves as the real Fleetwood Mac, hire powerful American lawyers to defend them, and record a new album. Heroes Are Hard to Find, released in September 1974, would, however, prove to be Bob Welch's last with the band. Despite, or perhaps because of, his being the driving force behind Fleetwood Mac regrouping, asserting their right to their own name and relocating to the States, Bob Welch was burnt out. After the poor reviews accorded to Heroes Are Hard To Find, he pushed for the band to move in a heavier, more Led Zeppelin-like musical direction. The others disagreed, so Bob quit. Mick Fleetwood was, however, in agreement that the band needed to change their sound. He had begun checking out local recording studios and producers, hoping that he might find one that would help them recreate the Mac magic. In LA's Sound City Studios, producer Keith Olsen played him an album that had recently been recorded there to show off the studio's capabilities. Mick was impressed with the guitar sound, but was distracted by a pretty petite blonde in the next room. When he asked who she was, Olsen told him that she was the singer on the record. The blonde was Stevie Nicks. The guitarist was Lindsay Buckingham. The album was their 1973 debut and only LP for Polydor, Buckingham Nicks, which had been a complete flop. Polydor had dropped them, and since then Stevie had been cleaning houses and waiting tables to make ends meet, while the pair worked on demos by night that Lindsay shopped around in the day. Stevie and Lindsay had met in high school in Arizona, and had both left home to join a San Francisco-based group called Fritz. It was 1967, the summer of love, and Fritz would open for the likes of Jefferson Airplane and Big Brother and The Holding Company, whose singer Janis Joplin was a big influence on Stevie. But Fritz's melodic soft rock style hardly fitted in with the psychedelic Bay Area scene, and the band went nowhere, finally splitting in 1971. By this time, however, Buckingham and Nicks were lovers, as well as musical partners. Each was the other's muse, and they were determined to make it, having moved to LA to be closer to the heart of the record business. Lindsay was an incredibly gifted and driven guitarist and arranger, with an obsessive vision similar to that of his hero, beach boy Brian Wilson. Stevie, meanwhile, was the archetypal sensitive romantic, a born artist whose songs and poetry came from the heart. They made quite a pair, and definitely came as a package. When Mick Fleetwood sounded Lindsay out about replacing Bob Welch in Fleetwood Mac, he was told that he'd only do it if Stevie joined too. The last thing that Fleetwood Mac were looking for at this point was another female singer, and Mick was careful to get Christine McVie's approval on the new edition. Luckily, Chris and Stevie hit it off immediately. As far as the incoming pair were concerned, they didn't have to be asked twice. They were broke and desperate, and here were these grand English rock stars turning up in a fleet of limousines, taking them out to dinner, and asking if they wanted a piece of the action. Lindsay was a big fan of the Peter Green albums, although he wasn't keen on the Bob Welch era of the band, and was particularly frustrated by having to go on stage and play and sing Bob's old songs. He had also had to give up his beloved Fender Telecaster to fit in with the band's existing sound. For her part, Stevie, never the hardiest of creatures, found the band's demanding tour schedule grueling. But both were determined to grit their teeth and bear it. The new lineup's first album together was 1975's Fleetwood Mac. The eponymous title was deliberately intended to suggest a fresh start for the band in a new, re-energized lineup. The record came together in a matter of weeks, 
with Buckingham, Nix and Christine McVie, all contributing songs that they'd written separately prior to the sessions. For the long-term members of Fleetwood Mac, this was the most exciting album they'd worked on since 1969's Then Play On. And they were determined that Warner's America should feel the same excitement and get behind it in a way they hadn't done on the band's previous half-dozen releases. This is not just another Fleetwood Mac album, Mick insisted. This is something special. And it was. A year after its release, Fleetwood Mac was still on heavy rotation on American FM radio, eventually breaking all records for sustained album airplay. Whereas previous Fleetwood Mac albums had each sold a steady 300,000 copies, Fleetwood Mac quickly broke through the one million mark and headed straight for the number one spot. The record's rise was helped by solid touring at increasingly prestigious venues and a string of hit singles plucked from the album by the record company, the first Fleetwood Mac 45s to do well in the States since 1969's Oh Well. Over My Head, Rhiannon and Say You Love Me were successive top ten hits, Stevie's Rhiannon in particular becoming an enduring classic. This mystical, haunting hymn to a Welsh witch tapped into a hidden seam of Celtic romance in the souls of millions of suburban American teenagers.